Well, thank you. Well, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm from uh, uh, Berkeley. I guess you would call that Berkeley here. And uh, if you haven't been there, it's, uh, it's uh, very close to San Francisco. We have a little train that takes about uh, 20, 30 minutes and uh, it goes under the water, under the Bay Bridge, and there you are in San Francisco. So uh, how many people have been to San Francisco? Yeah. So you probably didn't get over to Berkeley because there's too many things to do in the, uh, in the city. So there's a connection between uh, Berkeley uh, uh, and the UK. So the university was founded uh, by a library given to uh, the town from Bishop Berkeley. Uh, there's also a Barclay Castle that you can visit, an hour or so outside of London. So uh, there's an ongoing and strong uh, connection between our university, uh, Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, I haven't been here for more than 25 years. I gave a lecture 25 years ago uh, when I was visiting at the London School of Economics. And uh, I've been to Cambridge uh, more recently, but I'm happy to come back here and see this in, uh, incredible facility and uh, building. Uh, so I start with a very, very brief uh, history lesson. And uh, so uh, you may think that this idea of paper performance that I'm going to talk about is, is new. Uh, well, it turns out um, that's not the case. So uh, this is a photograph of uh, Emperor Qin. In 259 BC, before Christ, he was the emperor that unified China, made it this big uh, country. And so uh, why do I tell you that? He also had uh, a paper performance uh, scheme. And it was, in fact, in healthcare. So uh, uh, he had, of course, uh, many doctors that looked after his he his health and the health of his family, and uh, they were treated quite well. Um, good salaries, taken care of, nice housing. But if anybody um, in the emperor's family, or God forbid, the emperor himself, got ill, uh, he would uh, have their heads chopped off. So uh, that was the beginning of pay for performance. So if your performance was poor, uh, you would pay for it uh, by having your head chopped off. And so he managed to get pretty good service uh, from, the, uh, from the physician. So this is, in fact, uh, not a new idea. So the presentation has uh, three parts. I'm going to talk a little bit about pay for performance systems and I'm going to try to uh, uh, show you uh, basically how they operate if you're not familiar with them and um, I'm gonna even though I'm an economist and I could do a lot of mathematics and formulas uh, uh, just for a lunch presentation I've made this quite simple and direct and hopefully will communicate complicated things in a very uh, straightforward way uh, and then I'll report some work I've done at the OECD in Paris uh, surveying countries and uh, about their use for pay for performance and give you an idea of uh, how it's operating and uh, just talk to you about, uh, about pay for performance systems. So uh, I'm used to uh, speaking to students in public health and public policy and I find it very useful uh, uh, to give them the punchline of the talk at the beginning and not the end. So the punchline of this talk, or the takeaway, so to speak, is that um, pay for performance is happening uh, all over the globe at an increasingly rapid rate. And I'll show you information about the OECD, but I'll also give you a little bit of information about the World Bank. It's not only going on in developed countries, but also in Africa, Asia, low-income, middle-income countries. It is the new system to incentivize and pay for health care. It includes doctors, but it also includes hospitals and nurses. And so uh, this is the new payment mechanism. So for the next uh, decade or so, until they find a new one, uh, this is, will be the one that you will hear about and, uh, and one that you need to know about. So those of you that are not used to payment systems, I simply uh, list the various 
ways, and there are a limited number of ways you can actually pay for things in healthcare. Now, the first one is called fee for service. This is the most uh, commonly used one, and it, it's simply a piecemeal approach. It means every time you do something, uh, you send a bill in. <laughs> so if you see a patient, you send a bill in. If you uh, uh, have a script, you send a bill in. If you uh, do an x-ray or a scan or an MRI, you send a bill in, piece by piece. Second is uh, capitation. Uh, this uh, is more popular now, and, and what it says is uh, we're going to give you a certain amount of money for everybody um, that you take care of, or what the British call in their patch. A patch is uh, basically 1,500 to 2,000 patients, more or less, in the NHS, and was ever in their patch, they get a certain amount of money uh, per month to take care of them. And basically, you don't send in any bills. You get that amount of money, whether you treat them or you don't treat them, and hopefully you do treat them, uh, but you get to fix some. And then lastly, uh, well, not lastly, and then there's salary. We're all familiar with that. You know, we simply get a salary for our job. And then bonuses. Pay for performance uh, really deals with the bonus issue about how to bonus people. So though I listed uh, four ways of paying, uh, you'll often see these done in combination. So it's possible to have a salary and a bonus, a capitation and a bonus. It's possible to pay for FIFA service for some things and capitation for other things. So these can be mixed and matched. And then there's mon non-monetary uh, rewards. Liking your job and monetary things are important, but uh, um, you know, you have to pay people, and so money matters to almost everybody, including physicians who say, I'm here to help patients and, and take care of people, but at some point they have to take care of their family too and send their kids to college and all those kinds of things, and of course they're interested in a Jaguar and, you know, other, other kinds of uh, things in life, and so... Uh, but non-monetary things matter, uh, job satisfaction, all that. So this is, these are the kinds of things that motivate people in, uh, in healthcare. So I'll go over these rather quickly. Um, there are lots of definitions for pay for performance, often called uh, P for P, it means pay for performance. You'll see the various definitions. These are some from the United States, and I don't want to go through them point by point, but I want you to focus on the red word in each line. And what you'll see, more often than not, these are three different agencies in the U.S. The key word is quality. See quality in all those definitions? So the notion is we're going to pay people more for their performance, but the performance we're interested in is the quality of their work. And we'll talk about how to measure quality in a few slides. So the definitions all go to quality. The World Bank has a definition. They're more interested in performance because the World Bank is more economist performance is another term for efficiency. So it's a little bit different. USAID is more interested in health outcomes called health results. And the Center for Global Development, an important group in Washington, is interested in performance targets. You get the idea. It's all about performance, but mostly about quality. These are the kind of definitions that you'll see for pay for performance. So now is uh, what is what is pay for performance? So um, I'm going to spend a few minutes walking you through, and if you're able to absorb this chart, uh, you will become an instant expert in pay for performance. So let's look across the top. It says measures. What do you measure? Then it says what's the basis for the reward. And then lastly, what's the reward? So those are the three elements of pay for performance. Measures, that's key. In order to uh, do pay for performance and deal with quality or efficiency or performance, you have to measure things. And then you have to reward them, uh, and then you have to decide whether what kind of rewards you're going to give people. So let's go down to measures. So the two measures, as you might expect from the definitions that I already showed you, are, the, the, again, the two red words, quality and efficiency. 
So the question would be first, how do you measure quality in medicine? Uh, it uses a well-known uh, paradigm uh, developed by a professor who, uh, um, Don Abedian, who was at Michigan, University of Michigan, sociologist. And uh, he labeled it uh, structure, process, and outcome. The structure measure is one that looks at investment in technology, the facility, and the equipment. So you might go into a hospital. You have a wonderful, beautiful hospital here. If we wanted to use the structure measure, we would look at uh, uh, what's the technology in the operating room. What kind of scanner do they have? What's the latest imaging equipment they have? Uh, this would be a measure of the structure. The second would be the process. And so what do you do in medicine, the process? And the typical kinds of measures that we can get on the process side, as you see listed, would be uh, vaccination rates, for example, or people vaccinated, cancer screening, or, Say the guidelines say that all women over 40 need to have a breast cancer screen every other year. Does this happen in your patch, your 1,500 or 2,000 patients that you take care of if you're a primary care doctor? Uh, and also, do you follow treatment guidelines? So these are all quantitative things you can measure. <coughs> and then last, the one that we'd really like to have is... Uh, how well does your work relate to the health of the population? So you call it outcomes. Uh, it turns out the best outcomes we can actually look at, and I'll give you some examples, are uh, chronic care measures. So um, this would be, uh, there are patients who have diabetes, uh, do they have it under control? As a doctor, you could be responsible for that. Uh, have you done a good job informing them that smoking cigarettes is not a good idea? <laughs> uh, and so what's the rate of smoking in your, in your population? Uh, obesity uh, would be the same. Of course, you can't control everybody's diet, but the question is, are the people in your patch much fatter than the people in other patches? And if they are, well, maybe uh, you're not doing a good enough job in that area. So these are the kinds of things we can measure. We'd like to measure how healthy they are, how many years they live, and that's, but that's really hard to do. And it's hard to relate what you do to someone's longevity. But these intermediate outcomes of uh, diabetes and, and, uh, in particular, uh, I think, are uh, good ones. Um, others used would be asthma. How often do your uh, patients end up in a hospital because uh, they have an attack of asthma where they shouldn't? They should learn to manage it, and you can keep them out of the hospital. <coughs> so if your group has a lot of, particularly children, in emergency rooms for tax on asthma, you're probably not doing a particularly good job at that. So you get the sense of the kind of measures that we can use here. So they're hard numbers. We can count them. We can measure them. Now, you've got these measures, and of course the measures are going to give you some kind of score. I'm not going to go into the scoring unless you'd like me to. I do know a lot about it, but I think it would, uh, would take us far afield. Then the question is, how do you uh, reward people? So when I did this work uh, for the World Bank and for WHO, I read uh, with my graduate students six or 700 papers and reports to try to see uh, what the literature said. And I was able to boil them down into uh, these three methods. One uh, that's quite popular is an absolute a measure or a target. Physicians like targets. It says your temperature in, uh, in Fahrenheit is 98.6. I forget what it is in centigrade. That's normal. If it's 104, you should go to the hospital. So you know, they like targets and numbers. A target that we could use going back, say, to the breast cancer screening, um, say the target is 80%. Well, the women should be screened every other year. So if you hit that target, um, you're going to get some money for it. If you miss the target and it's 75%, you get nothing. Okay? So targets. Second way of doing this is to not have a target, but to, uh, to pay on uh, deltas or change in a measure. 
So sticking with the same example, just for simplicity, suppose the rate of breast cancer screening last year was uh, 60%, and this year it's 70%. So it's improved, obviously, 10%, but if you based it on a target, you wouldn't get any credit for that. But if you base it on a delta or a change, that 10% increase uh, would give you uh, some reward. Do you see the difference between a target and a change? And then the third uh, is quite simple because you're all familiar with it. It's called relative ranking, and it's the way we give grades in classes. So when I'm giving my grades out to my Berkeley students, uh, I rank them against each other, and the top uh, 10%, 15 20 whatever it is, might get an A, and then the next group would get a B. 40%, you know, get the idea, some kind of bell-shaped curve. Uh, that's a relative ranking, so you're ranked against. And so your performance would be ranked against comparable physicians uh, who do this work, and um, if you do better than them and you're at a higher relative ranking, uh, you would get more payment. Okay, so these are the three general methods. And again, let me say, uh, these overlap. You'll find healthcare systems that use all three of these, or well, they use them in combination, but these are the general methodologies. Then uh, the payment. So the payment is generally a bonus, and a bonus can be, uh, say, 10% of your annual wages. Uh, and in some healthcare systems now, uh, they're up to uh, 30%. So if you're making um, 100,000 pounds, that's probably for a consultant. The primary care physician, maybe 80,000 pounds. Yes, more or less. I'm, so you get 30% bonus. That would be 24,000 pounds. That's a lot of money. And then the question always comes, where does the bonus money come from? Is it additional money beyond what they pay you? In some systems, that's true. In other systems, they play a little game. Uh, it's called the withhold game. So they'll take your salary, which might have been, um, for simplicity, let's say 100,000 pounds, and they take 10,000 pounds away from everybody. So your salary is now 90,000. And then they use that pool of money to distribute it based on how good your performance and quality is. So you can get the 10% back, but some people will get none of it back, and some people can make as much as 30%. So it's budget neutral, but it redistributes the money based on how good your quality and performance is. So you'll see a bit of both. And then lastly, um, publicizing how good you are. Uh, so you can reward people by um, telling them they've got a good job, uh, but also telling the rest of the world they have a good job, they've done a good job. And so we, we see systems that do that. In the U.S., uh, there are some examples of states that actually will publish your name in the newspaper, a doctor, and say, this doctor is especially good, and he or she is, uh, patients have the highest performance in writing, and that does motivate people, no doubt. Uh, so these are non-monetary kind of incentives, quite important. So anyhow, to sum up then, pay for performance or what you measure, the basis of the reward and the reward. You have those three elements. Uh, if you have that fixed in your mind, you now know. If you didn't know before you came in, you now know what pay for performance is. So the last part of pay for performance, which is quite interesting, is um, who do you give the money to? Uh, and this turns out to be quite interesting. So the payer here... In this particular case, in the UK, of course, would be uh, the NHS. In the United States, it could be the Medicare program or some private health insurance. So, you know, the people with the money. <laughs> the top arrow, which goes all the way across, do they pay it uh, directly uh, to the physician or the worker? It could be to the nurse. That's why I called it a health worker. Or do they give it to the medical group or the institution, which is the arrow below, <clears throat> and have them decide uh, who gets the bonuses. Now, what's the difference between the two? So if you're in a medical school, 
And the NHS can give you the bonus directly, or they can give the bonus to the hospital, and then they would contact the chairman of your department, or chairperson, and uh, give them the pot of money, and say, uh, you know better who is actually doing well and working, you distribute the money. Okay, do so you see the difference? The first one doesn't allow a lot of monitoring, you don't actually know what's going on down on the ground. The second approach allows the department chairman, and who knows what's going on, to actually see if you're very helpful, not only for your own patients, but helping the group out. Because medicine is often about working together. And uh, the payer, the NHS, can't see that. They have no way of knowing that. So you see both these methods used. Sometimes uh, the second method is used for different reasons, and that is paid to individual workers. So when you see these paper performance things going on in low-income countries, say for example in Africa, it's much safer to pay the workers directly. Because if you give it to the institution, uh, the government or the medical establishment, the money disappears. <laughs> it never makes it down to the physician. Uh, because the people just take their share as it kind of moves down the system. So it's estimated that if you give them $100, 30 of $30 of it ends up back down at the workers. 70% of it gets taken off by various people who are uh, somewhat corrupt in various ways. So there's lots of different reasons for uh, using these two systems. So you not only have to have the bonus, the performance, but you have to figure out uh, who makes the decision and allocates the money. So uh, here's a survey that I did at the o with the OECD, and you know the OECD is in Paris. They survey questions, and um, so I developed a questionnaire with them, and you can see the kind of questions I, ans I asked uh, on the survey. And it's an o OECD survey. You can find it online if you want by just um, going to their website. Uh, whether a country had bonus payments for primary care, specialist hospitals. Uh, who earned the bonuses, what was the size of the bonus, types of measures used, and whether uh, the incentives or obligations to comply with treatment guidelines and practice protocols. So those are the general kind of questions. So let me give you kind of the big uh, picture of results so you can get a sense of this. So uh, in, in, uh, there were eight, uh, I guess, 15 countries that had primary care uh, used uh, pay for performance for primary care. That was about, now remember this survey is now a little bit old, 2009. Uh, so that was uh, about 40% of the OECD countries. This number is now doubled. You see the results for specialists and you see the results for hospitals. And uh, a key thing they use is a lot of them used, in this case 16 of them, close to half used, uh, treatment guidelines and protocols to allocate the bonuses. So let's look at the type of targets they use for P for P um, uh, because that was quite familiar. They use preventive care targets that would be like the screening example that I've used a number of times, breast cancer, prostate. And they have measures on how well you measure, how well you monitor chronic diseases. Uh, diabetes would be a key example of that. They have measures for IT uh, take-up, in other words, how well do you use information systems. They're quite sophisticated. Um, I don't know how sophisticated they are here in the UK, but in, in my world, uh, it started with Kaiser, which is in, uh, of course, our big HMO. Kaiser is a healthcare system private one, which is essentially um, bigger than the NHS <laughs> enrollment and the like. Uh, if you're a Kaiser member, you get online, make your appointments, uh, renew your prescriptions. Uh, if you have a procedure with a, a scan, you can get, on, get online and uh, look at the results yourself. And you can look at the comments that the physicians make about it. Uh, sometimes uh, they use patient satisfaction surveys, the usual thing, do you like the doctor or the hospital? And then the efficiency measures are mostly on whether you're using a cost-effective treatment.
you know, are you spending the resources wisely? Here's a little bit about countries. I'm going to go over this quickly, just so you can eyeball it. So it's the same data, but rather than a uh, summary, you can look country by country, and you can see whether they had pay for performance in primary care, specialists, hospitals, or treatment guidelines. You can see Japan uses them all. The Czech Republic uses them all, except in hospitals. Uh, if you go down now to look at the UK and the United States, they use all of them. So you can get the sense of what's going on now. So as I said, this data is about now five years old. It takes a long time to do these surveys and get the responses, but all of these have done nothing but go up. So whatever you're seeing now, it's an undercount. So in general, pay for performance for one of the 19 of the OECD countries. There's the summary. 15 in primary care, 10 in specialties, uh, 7 in hospitals, 7 countries. Most of the bonuses are paid for quality targets such as preventive care or management of chronic diseases. So that's the real evidence. When they start on pay for performance and quality, they look at prevention and screening and they look at the uh, how well you manage chronic diseases. So. Uh, I'll go over this quickly, but in the United States, there was an important report on the Institute of Medicine, two of them talking about uh, how unsafe it is in the United States. That initial report in 1999 uh, said that um, there were somewhere more or less about 100,000 people in the United States uh, that were killed in hospitals due to errors. The recent updated number is three times that. The number hasn't gotten worse, but the counting has gotten better. So uh, stay out of the hospital. It's a really dangerous place. And I'm not kidding about that at all. I'm quite serious. And so the push for quality now is, is clear. And this is just people who are killed. A lot of people are injured in a variety of other ways. And so uh, pay for performance is used to kind of incentivize people in the private and the Medicare program. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm from California. We have uh, in the state the, the largest pay for performance experiments going on outside the government. So in California, we have eight private health care plans, almost 12 million enrollees, 230 physician groups using pay for performance. They use 68 measures. It's quite complicated. Uh, in 2003 to seven, they spent $264 million. This um, is now about $2 billion. Just in pay for performance bonuses in California alone. The Medicare program has lots of demonstrations. I think everybody knows what the Medicare program is, the program for the elderly in the United States. Everybody gets it. When you turn 65, even Donald Trump has a Medicare card, whether he likes it or not. And uh, um, so there's a lot of work going on in the Medicare program, uh, looking at various demonstrations and using pay for performance. Uh, they're using it for end-stage renal disease. They're using it in nursing homes, electronic medical records, on and on and on. So how do physicians feel about this? Well, surveys say 73%, almost three-quarters of them, favor paying uh, physicians based on their quality or some of their salary or bonusing them on quality. So there's not a big resistance. However, 70% of them don't like the measures that we've come up with. And so when I give this talk to medical audiences, uh, Every physician who raises their hand and complains about the measure says something that uh, communicates in the following way. My patients are more difficult and sicker than anybody else's. Therefore, whatever you measure about me has got to be wrong. Every physician thinks that. And the answer, of course, that cannot be true because you're comparing one to another. But they all complain that the measures don't really adequately pick up how difficult their job is. And to some extent, I agree it's not perfect. Uh, but I think the patterns are clear <laughs> and the directions are clear. And uh, uh, maybe the precision isn't to the third decimal, but I think generally, uh, if you see physicians at the top of these measures, the bottom of these measures, they're really very different kinds of physicians. And the same for hospitals. 
Uh, some of them, a third, about a third, uh, actually support the public reporting. That is, not only to measure your performance, but actually to make it publicly available, either on a website or in a newspaper. And 80% of them uh, are, say the performance doesn't measure their high-risk patients. Well, you, you obviously know uh, the UK was into paper performance early and big in 2004. Uh, it's still going on. The experiment in 2004 was uh, close to a disaster. Uh, they put it out, they measured everything possible, uh, and, and they set the targets too low. So 99% of the physicians got bonuses. So it's like uh, setting up a scorecard and 99 out of 100 win. So just a political disaster, and uh, they gave huge bonuses to the doctors. You see the numbers there, uh, $23,000 in primary care, and, uh, and some of the measures, $70,000 uh, for consultants. Since then, it's gotten better, and it's reformed and all of that, but the UK is still using it, and big and better. Um, I'm going to spend two or three minutes just giving you a world tour now. So in Turkey... There's been big pay for performance in 850 hospitals. In New Zealand, uh, they have uh, used pay for performance in primary care throughout the country. Still going on. So this is a map of the world, obviously. And uh, here, I'm doing some recent work uh, with the World Bank. And uh, so the, the countries you're seeing there are basically mostly low in some low middle income countries. And every one of them that's uh, shown there that are white uh, is actually uh, starting to use paper performance and being funded by the World Bank. So if you think it's just something in OECD countries, you'd be wrong. So you see the number of countries in Africa, for example, or South America, and then you see Asia. So this is going on all over. It turns out that the, uh, the Norwegians are quite fond of this, and they've given a couple of billion dollars to the World Bank uh, to uh, promote and study uh, pay for performance in healthcare around the world. So this is really the Norwegians who are pushing this around. And so uh, it's now ubiquitous. It's now a worldwide phenomenon being used all over, whether you like it or not. That's kind of the reality of uh, what's going on. Uh, the research designs and the results to study the impact are still pretty poor. Uh, you'd like to study this using some randomized design. Uh, it's particularly hard to do that in a lot of countries. So imagine that I want to use a randomized design here and studying your hospital and another hospital. And one of the hospitals is going to be picked to get bonuses and the other one isn't. How does the hospital that pick not to get the bonuses, how are they going to feel once the political problems involved? So you see, implementing a randomized design when money is on the table <laughs> uh, is very tricky and very political. So it turns out to be not an easy thing to do. Uh, you can do it more easily in low-income countries, as it turns out, because they want the money <laughs> and they'll basically do it. So uh, maybe what I'll do is... Uh, Stop there, and at the end, there's a, a beginning set of references that you might look at if you want to do more reading uh, in this area. So, again, the punchline is pay for performance is happening. It deals with measuring, rewarding, and bonusing and paying. And it is the new way to pay for healthcare uh, globally. Uh, and uh, we're getting better at it. Um, it's not perfect, but uh, it's the best method we can think now to pay for health care, not only on the, on the quantity you deliver, but the quality of the services that you deliver as well. So let me stop there. I think I've used my time, and uh, thank you for your attention.